Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number two, seven, seven. That's two, seven, seven, dos, siete, siete. How are you guys doing, man? Good? Amazing. Great to hear. I'm happy. I'm happy you're good because I'm feeling great as per usual. Um, as you can tell, it's now the evening. It's my now, what, second day of one meal every day. I'm doing the OMAD uh, fasting kind of protocol or what do you call it? Oh, oh yeah, OMAD, right? You see it OMAD, OMAD or OMAD, whatever it's called, one meal a day. I'm feeling pretty good, feeling pretty nice and limber and bright and sprightly, which is a weird thing. But oddly enough, I've got this like weird taste in my mouth. I think because when you don't, you know, when you don't eat anything, you have this sort of like weird um, kind of taste in your mouth where it's sort of like when you don't brush your teeth, you have this weird kind of like gammy feeling. So that's the kind of thing I've noticed. But so far, so good. My energy levels have been pretty good, actually. I think, you know, I'm you know, speaking pretty quickly in here. I feel really excited and jumpy. But yeah, as per usual, welcome back to the Action of Zynga Show, the number one streetwear podcast in the world. As per usual, my idea of streetwear is that it encompasses all these different facets like art music fashion design current events tech startup life and all that stuff in between so if you want that and you like that kind of news and you like that kind of info then definitely stick around and listen to the show as per usual if you're watching via youtube and you want to come back again and see some other clips regarding myself smash that subscribe button if you like what you hear smash the like button and if you want to leave me a comment or you just want to give me some feedback give me a little comment in the comment section if you're listening via podcast app the only thing i ask you to do is just to share it share it leave a five star review that's all i ask from you if you're listening via the audio podcast and you're not watching via video share it share it and if you are listening on your video audio podcast where it's on spotify itunes or any other podcasting platform why not click my link you'll find it in the little description box my website extensionzinger.com when you go on my website web, website click youtube and go straight to youtube page and go through all my clips because i'll clip up little bits of the stuff that i talk about and upload them onto my uh youtube channel so definitely check that out if you're that way inclined but regardless um welcome back to the show and i hope you guys are well so much much uh loads of stuff to get through don't waste your time um number one thing to kind of kind of comment on and something that's kind of been uh, upsetting me uh today and you know well especially since yesterday's result is um may United. now i'm not going to ramble too much about football but it just got me thinking about politics because for a while i've kind of had this idea or this impression that you know people that are very are kind of like super into politics and get all hot and bothered about a certain politician saying a certain thing or a policy that they want enacted not coming not coming to fruition or just the you know the inability of big government to actually get things done and you know the bureaucracy around it and all that sort of stuff it just got me i just used to look at it and think you guys are losers right imagine being into politics you can't control anything about politics it's literally outside of your control even if you vote stuff is outside your control there's literally nothing you can do you have to it's such a slow moving process that it's not even worth your time if anything you should be concentrating on kind of local elections or stuff within your you know within your immediate um within your immediate vicinity whether it's kind of volunteering for your local council whether it's setting up little charities um i don't know whatever it may be right lending a hand where you can locally but not why not worrying about stuff that's happening nationwide because it's way outside your pay grade way outside your level of influence cool that's my one impression then I started, you know, then, you know, with the recent um, downturn of Man United's fortunes, you know, Man United were one of the more storied and successful clubs in the UK, in Europe, in the world. But, you know, recently through poor investment, through just, you know, mediocre management on the upper levels and just, you know, uh, bad luck sometimes with the players that we signed, we've now put ourselves in a position where we're kind of staring down the barrel of, you know mediocrity right we know what's going to happen next because usually you know football is the same like life right you're not gonna you're not gonna enact change especially drastic drastic change over you know overnight it's gonna take a while for you to like you know get to where you want to get to so if you if you kind of extrapolate that and you apply that same ideology to a football club or to a nation or to a community or to a local council you know it's gonna take a while for stuff to kind of get right or to go to you know go to a place that you wanted to get so i'm looking at my night now and i think to myself wow we lose to Burnley yesterday, right, in the Premier League. Burnley are, you know, a pretty average side in the Premier League. Stable side, don't get me wrong, but pretty average. They play a certain way. We know what they're going to do. You know, they're going to pump the ball long. They're going to look, um, look for little knockdowns and then knock it in. 
They have very big, fit and aggressive players who play a particular kind of brand of football. They've got a manager who knows exactly how to drill them in a precise way to play. So if anything, they're, the, they're a team that shouldn't surprise you. You should, be, you should be aware of what to do when playing against them, right? And we had no answer. We had no idea how to play against them. And you look at that game and you can tell and you can say, you know, even if you're a novice looking at that game, you're like, you know what? We were beaten by the better side. Not not that they had better players. And that's right. I mean, there's not many players on that Burnley side that will get into the Man United side, even though it's a poor example. And there's not many Man United players that want to go to Burnley. But they beat us because they were a better drilled side. And because they're why are they better draw side? Because the person that bought the club or the person that owns the club wanted to play a particular brand of football that's going to ensure that they, you know, have Premier League survival. So they went out and got a manager like Sean Dice, who has a particular brand of football, who's got very who's very experienced, who also knows how to kind of identify the players, who's got a good coaching staff. So all this stuff at the top is sort of trickled down and it resulted in, you know, Burnley being able to beat Man United at home, away from home, sorry, you know, in the first time in however many years, right? Success for them, right? So congratulations to Burnley. If you're a Burnley fan, well done. But then looking at it, I was like, you know what? I was watching all these fan cams, people getting annoyed, people getting pissed off and swearing and, you know, really getting irate. And I was really mad too. I, you know, it took me what, ages to go to sleep yesterday because I was just in my bed, like kind of, you know, tossing and turning, thinking about just how horrible the next couple of years are going to be for United or maybe five years, maybe even 10 years in terms of us kind of re- rebuilding and kind of getting back to where we need to get to. And I was thinking, wow, this is what people in politics must feel like. Oh, fans of politics, right? People that kind of watch Question Time and, you know, and debate about stuff with their friends and bars and stuff, right? It's, it's annoying, but if if you treat politics like sports, you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, how the hell are these guys or these girls so unaware? How can they not see that this thing is a thing to do? This policy is what to do. You should enact this change, this change in law, this change in whatever. How can they not see it? And I guess that's where the kind of frustration comes from. But in my head, for me personally, because there's not enough time in life to really get work, to worry about things that are not in my control, I just step back. I think I used to get a lot more annoyed back in the day. I think when I was younger, there was times where I'd like throw the remote against a wall if my United lost or I'd not, I won't speak to anyone. You know, I had that kind of temperament. But in, over the years, I've just, got, I've just gotten to know that, you know what, there's nothing I can do really, right? I can have a very reasoned and rational view about what's going on i can look at it and think you know what i know what the issue is here but there is genuinely nothing i can do and even if i do know the issue what's going on there might be other issues at hand that i have no idea about that are playing into the, the reason why we're where we are so if anything it kind of reinforces the idea that jordan peterson says about you know uh, personal responsibility we're worrying about you know things outside of your control especially when your own life is such a mess is in such disarray is genuinely a waste of time and resources and if anything it's a weird sort of like virtue signaling thing right don't get me wrong football fans can just vent it's just you know it's an entertainment thing you know whatever it may be but there is a part of me it's also like if you're really into politics and you're always talking about stuff especially with your friends which is the worst thing because no one wants to be that friend no one wants to be friends with that friend right that's kind of always rabbing on about something trump did or something boris johnson did like no one cares shut the fuck up but if you are that person there is a little bit of you that's a bit virtue signally right you want people to know how aware you are of world politics and how fair and rational you are and how you know compassionate and all that stuff you are but really and truly there are things in your own life that you should be really focusing on that would probably that probably need your real attention as a part from the stuff that's going on in you know in the house and commons or whatever maybe but yeah it just got me thinking i just think you know what and i i get it now why people are fans of plots and why they kind of you know spend so much time worrying about stuff that's happening in politics but for me no way. I refuse to kind of get involved in that stuff, man. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Um, United are going to be terrible for a while. There's nothing I can do about it. And I'm just going to stand out. I'm just going to stand from the sidelines and just kind of hope that we get the Glazers out and the new owners come in and they want to make money. Because if you want to make money in the football club, you're going to want them to do well. And to do well, you need someone with a vision. So you're going to get a football director, you're going to get director of football, whoever they're called, to come in and spec out an entire plan for five, ten years, respective of managers, and just say, you know what? Here's what we want. We want to achieve this. We want to you want to have this milestones. Here's the things we're going to tick off along the line. And then you just fit the place, the thing, the people in place. Boom, 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 boom. But at the moment, because it's so slapdash and because we're just so, so many amateurs and we've got an accountant as a football director with a team of football experts and advisors who don't come in front of the camera because they don't have a clue what they're talking about. And then we have an inept coach who is a club legend, but he's trying his best. And we have a bunch of players who are terrible, but they're trying their best. 
it's a complete shit show, really, isn't it? But yeah, I think yeah, that's basically my my point in it. I just I've let go, man. I've let go. Whatever will be, will be. And I hope in the future, somewhere down the line, we get new owners and they come in and they have an aspiration to have a club that they can kind of brag about when they're at cocktail parties. Right? When you want that, if you're an owner, especially a foreign owner, like, you know, when you're kind of measuring dicks at a cocktail party, you want to talk about your successes. You wouldn't want to mention Man United and, your people, and the person you're talking to be like, you want them to be like, oh, wow, I saw you guys, you won, you won that league champion thing, right? You what you want them to say, right? Champions League, you want league champions. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You want to just, uh, you know, what are you going to talk about? Say how you sealed the deal for a Colgate sponsorship or something. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, let's move on. Who cares? Um, let's go. I've got a little topics to run through here. I don't want to waste your time. What's the topics we've got here to go through? Number one. So, um, sad news in clubbing world. Supposedly, Grease Mueller, the legendary Berlin club, is closing at the end of the month. Now, this news has kind of been percolating for a few weeks, I think. I think since the end of the end of last year. I think um, last week there was this assumption that it, they somehow got an extension for a couple of weeks or for the end of the summer. Uh, but then now through just weird, I don't know if it's miscommunication with the local council or the people that were um, going to buy the land in the first place. Now, so supposedly that's not going to happen. I think there was the assumption that they were always going to be on temporary land. But I think it was like a six-month rolling lease or something along those kind of lines. But then something changed last minute. And now the company they've sold the land to that Greece Media is on, they've now kind of pulled out. And now they don't know what to do with the land, but they still said they have to close. So it's a weird thing to kind of be in. doesn't really make much sense. But um, so far, a lot of the Berlin community have kind of galvanized and they're protesting about it. But it's a real shame because Greece Mula has was probably the first place I went to when I went to Berlin, I think, for the first time. My first kind of clubbing experience, I remember thinking it might have been super cold January sometime. I don't know where it might have been, 2011 or whatever. I'm not sure what year it was. But I remember it being really cold and we was outside and, you know, sitting in that kind of, they got this weird contraption thing, this sort of like an adult adventure park thing and just sitting outside, you know, high off my nut with my friends, talking for hours and hours about how we're going to change the world with our club nights, right? Crazy stuff. But I remember it being just a great experience, like finding all the little rooms, and just, you know, going into the little, um, what's that, oil drum thing when they had performances in there sometimes. Just a really cool place to hang in there. And obviously, the legendary part is that Cocktail de Amor, right? Like a legendary kind of uh, Berlin club night that was kind of, that's kind of geared more towards the queer, the queer scene over there. But just, you know, generally kind of, you know, book some of the best DJs. Daniel Wang wrote a kind of real big piece about their club night. Just a really good amazing place. But anyway, let's read through the article from RA that kind of um, mentions what's going on. Um, so it says here, uh, Club Culture, Club Culture is Culture, which I, I, I'd imagine is club culture or is culture, right? Hundreds gather in Berlin to protest Greece Mueller's closing. Uh, this is from RA. News broke early that the club will remain open one extra weekend uh, for the popular party Cocktail de Amor, which is great news for all you people that are going to be in Berlin during that time. I was meant to be in Berlin during that month, but lastminute.com, you know, I kind of felt because my friend wanted to go to this club night here in London. And you, you know, feeling really up for it. And again, I thought, you know, maybe I might as well just stagger my Berlin excursions for next month because, you know, everyone's got bills to pay for, or, you know, they're trying to get your finances back in order for the whole Christmas and holiday season. So I thought, you know what, maybe I'll go to the end of February. But I wish I kind of was going now at the end of January because it would have coincided with the last cocktail there more ever, or maybe potentially ever. That would have been a nice time to kind of go and kind of cement that memory. But, you know, say la vie. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that by the time I go in February, it's still open, but you never know. So let's read the article. This is from Resident Advisor. It says, hundreds of people gathered in Neuklon, uh, Berlin on Wednesday to protest the closing of the beloved club Grease Müller. By 4 p.m., a large crowd, young ravers, older folk and mums... <laughs> Uh, had assembled outside the local town hall, waving flags and placards with slogans say, like "Let's let us dance, dan hard trance against profit and akab." All clubs are beautiful. Classic tunes played from the sound systems. One state, one small stage. Various uh, politicians and stakeholders made brief speeches, uh, occasionally amping up the atmosphere. I wish that some of that stuff was made into merch. That'd be quite cool. Again, I think when a lot of these clubs close. Again, it's rare, very rare if this happened to happen in Berlin because for the most part, Berlin has a very um, symbiotic, a very kind of uh, kind of close relationship with the local council. I think the local community or especially people that are in, in government 
uh, recognize the profit, recognize the, you know, recognize the benefit, the asset that clubs uh, have for Berlin overall and the money they bring in for the tourists and, you know, all the, the jet set, uh, the techno jet set crowd and all that stuff. So the techno easy jet crowd or whatever they call, what, what was that book called? There was a book about it, right? Um, or techno ravers, whatever they call it, techno tourists, whatever they are. So they recognize the value of them. So there's always a really good relationship with the clubs and local communities. They do try their best to make sure that they are in good state with their neighbors. They kind of, they have this fund that allows them to soundproof their, you know, their rooms. Um, they have all these kind of initiatives that are going to kind of trying to get people in the local community involved. Loads of stuff that kind of allows the clubs to kind of, in effect, kind of, as long as they play by the rules to kind of go about and stuff without having to kind of, you know, really jump through any hoops that you would do here in London. So it's rare when these clubs close, but when they do close in Berlin, it would be great if they had a possibility to kind of, because I'd imagine a lot of the bartenders that work in Berlin ha can kind of have an actual life. Because again, Berlin, you know, the rent is cheap. So if you're, if you're able to kind of hustle and bounce around from places, you could potentially uh, make a lot of money or makes a good amount of money paying rent, going out, living a good life, just working behind a bar in a club. You know, you, you, you cultivate a great community, you meet interesting people, and you get to kind of partake in this kind of once-in-a-lifetime experience, you know, living and existing in these clubs. So when they close down and that money kind of, you know, gets pulled out of your pocket, it would be great if they had a little fund, which would maybe kind of sponsored by merch and T-shirts where they're able to kind of like, all the proceeds from the merch sold can kind of get put into a pot so that when you leave, there's a bit of a severance package that is given to you. Because I imagine there isn't much, right? Because it's a nightclub, right? I'm assuming a lot of the money is cash in hand, you know, it's whatever it may be, tips and stuff. But it would be great if they had the ability to have kind of allow some people to have a little bit of money, a little bit of a, a cushion to kind of, you know, sustain them as they kind of then go to other places. Because imagine some of the bigger clubs, especially with the ones that have been around for ages, I would imagine most of the bartenders probably don't even leave, right? Security don't leave, bartenders don't leave, bar managers don't leave, program directors, event managers, they probably just will hang around because, you know, why else would you go? It's a dream job. So if they had a little fund that was kind of, you know, mainly uh, from the profits of merch, from these like, nice slogans like let us dance, hard trance against profit, A cab, that would be awesome to see, man. Um, anyway, it continues. Um, even this one's the best one, actually. Club culture is culture. Um, hollered um, Farkar leaked a deputy mayor of Neuklund. Oh, awesome. The, even the mayor of Neuklund came out. Uh, it's a loud whoops and applause. A big announcement came early. Uh, via Greece Miller founder David uh, Sierra, the club will remain open one extra weekend for the popular party cocktail de amour, which is honestly one easily one of the best club nights I've been to in a while. I love the artwork. The Facebook group is probably one of my one of the most funniest with their memes and stuff. And again, if you really want to understand the kind of like the real the real kind of Berlin queer scene and what it's actually about, what it's kind of built on, definitely go ahead and, and go check them out. Uh, they do some amazing stuff. The whole crew around them, some of the DJs that are associated with them as well, are great. So definitely go check them out. Um, now scheduled for Saturday, the February the first is, is the last one. This is a total turnaround. Early this week, the club's landlords cancelled the closing. The good news was met with cheers, uh, though the larger issue is still remains. And obviously they've got this amazing bit of merch. So again, stuff like this will sell like hotcakes. And again, all the profits could go to a little pot that could then, you know, support, especially that could be put into a pot for other, other even bartenders that work in other clubs and stuff. Um, but that's an awesome little tea. It's a little hat basically in the form of, um, for those listening via all the podcasts, sort of like in the form of a MAGA hat, they've made like a cocktail deal more, make cocktail rave again, which is pretty cool. And that would be awesome if they've made it into an actual hat to sell and the profits could kind of be divvied up for people. And this is a... This is a quote from, this is another quote again. The, the, spa the space isn't actually being used. This is a comment from the article. The space isn't actually being used for anything. No development's happening for a couple of months, said one Grease Miller regular who's lived in Berlin for three years. There's no reason why the club shouldn't operate as usual. What's the point in, what's the point in the plot being left vacant? It's a shame for everybody, for the community, for everything that's happening here. It's not just a music event. There's a mobile kino cinema. There's, oh, yeah, there's flea markets too. Why shouldn't the space be used? It's not fair on anyone. It's one of the last bastions of true techno underground scene in an increasingly commercialized space such as Berlin, which is definitely true. A lot of the proper underground spots, the ones that you won't find on TripAdvisor or on some YouTube video, they're kind of disappearing, which maybe is a move that Berlin's doing overall. So kind of, they're trying to steer it more towards a kind of... Uh, ex template of Amsterdam there's not many underground clubs in Amsterdam it's mostly nightclubs again they're supported really well the night czar there does a good job as opposed to our shitty night czar we have here in London Amy Lamy but for the most part 
um, there's no real underground culture in like Amsterdam. You're not really going, you know, through a dark tunnel, you know, stepping over, you know, piles of human feces into into a nightclub somewhere. Whereas in Berlin, the, the thing that made it beautiful was that you had these big commercial clubs like Berg, like Berghain and stuff, or like Trezor. But you also had these really sweet underground places. Um, under a bridge somewhere behind a nondescript door that you had to bang on, you know, to the sound of fucking, you know, YMCA to kind of get in. Um, and it's a shame those are disappearing because that's kind of made the beauty of these places. Because by and large, it doesn't really matter if they don't have... It, it, it would... The, the reason why underground clubs are beneficial because by and large, there's a real big disparity, especially in places in Kreuzberg. There's every, like, if, you want, if you're a tourist, you just want to go out somewhere and get smashed. Those places will accept you, no, you know, all, all arms welcome, as long as you're not so mashed up. But then there should be a place for every sort of kind of crew. But now you've only kind of left, I don't know, you're only kind of left with the commercial clubs. It doesn't necessarily have the same kind of a law as a Grease Mueller would. Especially if you see some of the club kids that go to Grease Mueller, they are another level from the ones that you would see even in Bergheim, right? It's a whole different scene. Um, uh, da, 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 da. So it continues here. It's one of the last places. Techno said another protester. His friend who was holding a cardboard sign that said Techno Acid Hardcore Trance Anal Sex Gabba said it's amazing venue. A place where you can really be your true self. Where you can find your true self. To lose somewhere like that really hurts. Definitely. I've definitely had some great times there, man. Sitting outside on the wooden benches. Talking shit to randoms. And it continues here. Now Cotto Demo is back on. It's unclear whether the rest of the next week's schedule also remains. Before news of the extension, the team around announced a closing party for a closing party for this weekend called Grace Mueller Is This The End which may or may not still be going ahead opened in 2011 wow I probably went there just when it oh bloody hell a Grace Mueller former pasta factory will come to an end on its current rental contract in January 31st the owners of the club plan to knock it down and build offices like, such a shame in it what an amazing space to be in it's all kind of getting knocked down for that but yeah that's everyone protesting in Neuklin people holding up their placard let me see if I can see anyone that's actually got anything about the club culture is culture on Instagram. That'd be great to see someone actually put a hashtag of that up there. But again, it's a shame, man. It doesn't happen often in Berlin. Usually a lot of the clubs kind of run out of steam, run out of money. There are some underground places that have shut down, don't get me wrong, through just, you know, local council stuff. But they do have a good... They, there is a good relationship between the council and between local authority and clubs. So it doesn't necessarily... It's not a thing that usually happens a lot. So it's a shame this thing is actually happening to them, especially a place like Greece, really, man. It's such an institution. Like most people, like you know, again, if you've been to Berlin and you're really about this life, you'll know. You'll know it's definitely one of those places to go. See if anyone's put that club culture. It's club. No, okay, nothing so far. Uh, let's see if I can see if someone's put anything about Grease Mueller on there, just as a kind of uh, as a kind of hashtag, just in case people are talking about it. I just want to see if there's any posts we can see what has happened with the protest here, live and direct. Let's see what's happening here. But yeah, it's a shame, man. I wish I, again, I wish I was there. Honestly, wish I was there right now. It'd be so cool. Yeah, people are protesting here. I'll put the plaque of the thing up here now. Kaina Mac Dan Florin. I don't know what that means, but yeah, loads of protest placards. Loads of people out actually coming out and actually supporting, which is great to see. Another sign here. It was that embrace our culture, spray paint on the roof of Grace Mueller. Anything more? What was that a fashion show? This is a, from a club line, isn't it? Okay, people... Yeah, they do loads of fashion shows in there. Again, it's a great place, man. It's honestly one of my favorites. It's really, really cool. Really fun spot. I'm not going to lie. People are protesting here on the outside. Solidarity, everyone standing out there talking. Again, it's really cool to see how the local community comes around, isn't it? It really gathers, you know, and supports each other in this sort of occasion. Because again, th this hurts everyone. It doesn't just hurt them. Do you know I mean, it hurts the whole community. So the fact that people can just come in and gather around, especially during a weekday, it's great. See? Everyone's out supporting the cause. It's a whole different vibe here. It's a whole different vibe. It's completely awesome to see that happening. But yeah, cool to see, man. And hopefully they they reach a good re a core resolution sometime soon. Because again, it'll be a real shame to lose that space. But like I said, it's, it's one of my first places when I went to when I went to Berlin. Yeah, here they go. Everyone playing classic tunes. Really kind of yeah, but yeah, cool to see man. So definitely go to Berlin and you're curious to see what yeah, it's about. You're gonna be there before the um before January the thirty first, especially before February first. Definitely go check it out. Support them if you're around and just kind of lend a helping hand if you can. And again, fingers crossed it works out and they're able to kind of bounce back and we're able to get in a bit of an extension on their lease, at least for the time being. 
Um, anyways, continue on here. Do, 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 do. In more DJ electronic music news from this one, Mix Mag now, we have a new venue opening up in London. One venue is closing, another venue is popping up. So, again, the yin and yang of life. London's getting some new venue called Canvas, funnily enough. It's opening up, um, I think, next to, next to the Oval. Same people that own that. It's an article from Pickle, so sorry, from Mix Mag, sorry. Um, it says the following here a new club called Canvas is opening in London next month. Uh, Eclair Fifi is playing all night long at the opening party. It says the following a 400 capacity club is opening in East London next month. The space is called Canvas, is a new venue from the team behind Oval Space and the Pickle Factory, and it'll be located next door to the sister venue, which is great to see because it means that they're essentially buying out or renting out the entire space. If you've been to Pickle Factory, you know it's like on this little roundabout. It's like a little thing that you kind of go around and there's like a factory, there's buildings all around. I think the other side is like studios. So they're essentially taking over the entire thing. They're buying all these little lots up, which is great because I think the cause guys did a similar sort of thing. And I imagine those places are probably going to get knocked down and built into like, you know, fucking shiny uh, metal flats soon. Maybe in a couple of days, maybe in 10 years or so, which is great. But in the time being, they're allowing nightclubs to kind of set up shop because he does. You don't need to like kit them out too much. Don't need to like. There's no much. Don't need to do too much restructuring to kind of get a club up and running. I'd imagine so to an existing building, right? Just need to make sure there's electricity, running water, a good you know all that source, all that good stuff, some soundproofing. But you don't need to change much of it structurally to kind of get it up and running. So the fact that some of these landlords are able to kind of notice that hey, if we allow these guys to be like quote unquote. Um, guardians right of our spots we can allow them to kind of you know make sure it's well maintained it's looked after and then once we're ready to go we have this blank canvas we can just kind of rip up and sometimes in some respects you know we've kind of kicked you out electricity we've given you a spot so it kind of makes their job a little bit easier too so it's great to see and i like the fact it's called canvas maybe it's like a blank canvas they can do more stuff at and um opening that with a clear fifi which is great as well which means they might be more of a bent or more of a especially the program might be more of an idea to kind of steer it more in the realm of like residents playing every week which would be bad which would be great in my opinion if it turns into a place where you have the same two or three djs playing every week plus a guest please make that um again it allows up and coming djs like myself to have a place to kind of aspire to go to to kind of you know get a guest spot or to kind of have a gig there and it also allows punters even like myself too to kind of know there's somewhere i can go to to hear a DJ that I like, right? If I if I know I like a Claire Fifi, I know where to go and see her, you know, two weekends out of the month, right? In this London club somewhere in the middle of Bethnal Green, as opposed to like how it usually is I have to kind of go in her RA, check if she's around. It's just annoying. So if this if they're able to do that, that'd be amazing going forward. But let's read the article a little bit. It's a new 400 capacity club opening up in East London next month. The space is called Canvas. The uh, Percolate has invited a Claire Fifi to play late uh, night to play all night long for the opening party with a venue taking the leap uh on february the 29th tickets are on sale now and can be purchased here now again this is an interesting thing i want to know if, if anyone has any information out there from the london scene let me know why is it that when these new clubs open up they have to do an opening night like especially that launch like this right in association with, with in association with like a well-known promoter or like promotional club night why does it have to be like that why can they just do their own in-house thing <laughs> right let that run put it out market it well make sure people come and then start going out and get promoters because i always feel as if like when they start off with promoters it's there's no synergy really because if i'm an if i'm a percolate fan they usually have i don't know, let's say I've, I've never been to a percolate party but let's imagine they usually do their parties in like free venues like yeah corsica mix and somewhere else right I know them for I know them for putting on parties in those venues. And I've got memories. I'm attached to those venues. So if they throw a new party somewhere in the middle of Bethnal Green, I'm unlikely to go. Right? It's not going to really call. It's not going to really call to me, especially if they have a different way of kind of programming the nights. Imagine if Percolate usually have this thing where they they kind of you know book loads of DJs to play all, all together at the same time. The fact that they got one person will kind of put me off too. So why don't club? Why don't new clubs just absorb it? take the hit and take the gamble and just say, you know what, we're going to book a DJ to play in our club, just have it as like an opening night party, like the first party, and just then go and then kind of work it from that way. And then maybe pay the promoters to maybe, you know, retweet it or to market it or to share it on their page, fair enough. But I never got the idea of like latching onto a promoter to kind of put the opening night on, especially when no one knows anything about the club. Maybe it's different with uh, Percolate. Maybe, again, I'm speaking out of turn because they might put on their nights an oval space and pickle factory. So they're hoping that people will just kind of pass by and go there. But I don't know, man. Usually, if you're going to, per if you're going to pickle factory oval, you've already bought a ticket anyway, right? You're, you're not necessarily walking 
It's not necessary. It's not in a. There's not much a. There's not much a passing trade there, right? It's a kind of like tucked in behind, a, you know, behind some buildings and stuff. You really have to kind of go there with intention. So I never really got that. I don't really know. Maybe someone's gonna answer it. Answer it for me. Leave me and let me know in the comments below if you know what the answer is behind that. But it's always kind of. Hmm. But anyway. So the following, so tickets will be uh, percolated and violated. If you need to play all night long, the opening pile, which is going to be at the venue, uh, taking a leap on February 29th. Tickets are on sale now and can be purchased here. And I can't wait to share the space with you. It says um, it's the best party. To, uh, it's a perfect party to place. It's a perfect place to party, said Declare Fifi. Head over to the campus website to check it out. And again, here's a flyer. I quite like the flyer. Declare Fifi all night long, presented by Percolate um canvas e2 so yeah definitely good to see man let's see what it happens to see what it looks like i'm interested to see what the kind of venue is going to be like i've not seen the inside of it have they got an ins instagram really set up with pictures of the place it doesn't look like it no is it no no pictures of the actual venue oh okay they have the opening night already usually they have this ready right they usually already have a little bit of an opening night that's like a soft launch maybe like a little spoken word thing it looks like right photography blah, 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 blah. yes people big you okay musicians playing and stuff doing a thing and then usually then they have the electronic night happening after the fact. So yeah, good, cool to see. Interesting to see what kind of programming they'll do. If it'll be more like smaller DJs playing there, hopefully that'll be a thing. Again, I would love to see more resident DJs playing in a place like this and then kind of build it out that way. And maybe again, it'll be more interesting if they do that because, you know, they've got pickle factor and oval. There's no point of picking, booking the same kind of people to play there. And imagine if there's is probably that kind of level of a DJ, like from 400 to maybe 600 venue places. But then oval space is like, I don't know. That's like a, that's like a Ricardo Villa Lobo spot, isn't it? That place is fucking massive. So that might not be the best place to kind of have her sound. And obviously, again, I'd love it if we had a place where you could actually go if you're a fan of a Claire Fifi and just see her play all the time right in a venue like that that'll be excellent to see but yeah awesome to see the Claire Fifi playing at E2 29th of February um, tickets are available now I'm sure on resident on resident advisor there should be now available I'm pretty sure where you can purchase tickets here uh, da, 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 da. Let's see how much the tickets are tickets yeah good price early but tickets are still available now for a fiver so definitely go check that out if you're that way inclined uh claire fifi playing all night long at the new venue in london called canvas which is in nick oval basically you won't probably be able to miss it so definitely check that out if you're that way inclined again i like that whole operation i think they've got cool security guards the door people are usually quite cool the sound is amazing bit pricey at the bar but you know what can you do it's london but all in all if you're gonna go out for an actual club night clubbing night then i definitely would encourage going there and again you know it's quite a cool little spot to go to and again it's open until five that's what been amazing as well so 11 till five which is great then you've got the central and station just around the corner for you to hop on the train and go home what's next here do, 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 do. oh uh, should i be a this is something that's interesting right so this is an article from electronic beats um, and they do this whole resolutions things about like, oh, you know, resolutions about how to progress within an electronic music scene and dance scene. It had to be, you know, a better artist, better DJ, better producer, whatever it may be. And they got this cool little article about how to accelerate your DJ career, right? And they highlighted No Shades, this girl called Kiki, Kaki, Kaki Lomo, Kiki Lomo, Kaki Lomo, how do you pronounce her name? Kiki Lomo, really? I wish I could know how to pronounce it, Kiki Lomo. So No Shades like a, a collective, I'm pretty sure, that promote kind of non-binary queer female DJs, which is quite cool on their platform. I'm sure they have like an accelerator program or something, mentorship, where they kind of allow them to kind of go through their program and then kind of have let them have access to their contacts and all that stuff and, you know, kind of uh, prop up their careers. And of course, if you're familiar with dance music, you'll know that, you know, most of dance music, most of that kind of scene is kind of, you know, dominated by, you know, straight white males you know like that we're all black and that play a particular brand of techno whatever it may be so it's cool to see regardless right in regards to my opinion the whole thing is cool to see but i don't know man there's a the reading the issue i was like jesus i think i'm missing out a trick on here right with these with these collectives so this is resolution 2020 how to accelerate digital career with this um dj called kiki lomo i'm pretty sure maybe that's her name again if i got it wrong my apologies from electronic beats i'll put the link in the bio for you guys to read it yourself but it's a pretty extensive article and it essentially kind of charts her whole experience and some of her kind of key um 
tenets of like what you should do in order to kind of you know boost your DJ gigs and just to kind of get out there and be a better DJ all in all number one as you say start off with the right career intention which I love right um, she says the following it's really important to understand what you want to DJ uh, understand why you want to DJ if you go in with the motivation to achieving some kind of accolade or fame there's a limitation to that for me the reason why I want to DJ is because I would just love sharing good music with good people and with cool people sorry that process of exchanging energies in, in the crowd I think that intention itself is really instrumental in helping people's growth because when you reach out to promoters or potential collaborators, that passion is really transparent. Or conversely, the lack of good intentions or lack of genuineness is clear. Have you agree with that? I think you can usually tell the people that are just in it for the fame and they usually don't hang around for long anyway, so I don't usually worry myself too much with that. I think you can tell it in every industry, the ones that are just in it for the clout. I think still, though, because it's such a... Because I say DJing now, I think going back to the whole Daniel Wang article from before, talking about how music probably changed in the 1980s when, you know, the introduction of MIDI. Because before then, you had to, like, know an instrument in order to make music, right? I read these books with, you know, uh, James Baldwin and, you're, um, uh, you know, and you're like, oh, so oh, even the Elton John book, actually, I just finished reading now. And you're like, wow, you forget just how hard it was to make music back in the day you had to have a whole band you had to get people into a studio and record on different tracks and then somehow put that stuff together and make it you know and make it kind of you know and make it uh make it something that people are going to like nowadays it's, it's a lot easier to kind of make a record because you have some sort of frame of reference as well back then you didn't have that maybe frame of reference right we don't, you have all this history of great music you can kind of look back on so the DJ is the same, right? It's easier to do because you don't need to buy vinyl. You don't need to buy a turntable. You don't need to know how to know, look, mix with uh, vinyl without seeing the BPM. You know, it's all easy to do. So there's a lot more people doing it. Even the ones that are clout chasers, they fall off. But still, the ones that are good at it, they're still hanging around. I'm always, I've always maintained that, you know, there's probably loads of really cool underground DJs that you've never heard of who absolutely smash their local scene, who could easily play a festival stage, easily play at your, the biggest club in the world, easily. Because there's so many of them around and just do it for the love and do it for the passion. But obviously that intention is really important because there's so many places that you can go with it. You could be like, you know, a person that plays all the little kind of, a little, little, all the kind of um, sceny things and streetwear and fashion. You could do all the things where you're playing in a corner of a shop somewhere and all these kind of store activations. You could be the person that plays at hotel lounges. You could be the person that plays on boats and cruises and stuff. You could be playing in casinos, festivals, electronic fest, uh, EDM festivals, um, more like niche ones, commercial ones, big clubs. Well, there's so many places you can go. So if you're not in, if you don't have a clear attention where you want to go, you end up getting lost in the source, and then there's no way of you kind of kind of steering a ship in a certain way. You end up you end up playing a cruise somewhere that you don't want to be at, even though it pay, because it pays well. So I'd imagine that's a good place to be. And then she says, uh, number one here, number two, step into the new year with a list of goals, which I really like. She says she started with, I started with a list, uh, I started last year with a list of goals. I wanted to DJ internationally. I wanted to DJ at a, high, a large scale festival. And in terms of the power of setting intention, that's something I've always done. I've always moved towards something. I'd feel lost without that. I don't, it doesn't always have to be anything specific, career based either, but maybe something I wanted to try or bucket list for more mundane, you know? I do believe in the power of manifestation. Being able to put your goals out there and constantly working towards them really does help you focus and look for opportunities that will help you achieve them, which is true, isn't it? Again, if you don't know where you're aiming, you don't know what you want. If you don't know what you want, you don't know where to aim. So that's all pretty clear. And then third, clearly state what you want. Again, pretty self-explanatory. Four, prioritize your, your visibility, which is, again, a really hard one for me at the moment. So if you start out as a DJ, have a presence, have a presence online. I know it sucks, but it's one of the most important tools that people can use, and it shouldn't be necessarily seen as a bad thing, which is honestly one of the weirdest things about dance music, right? A lot of the scene has been, has kind of in, finally kind of accepted the role of social media, right? I look at some, I look at a label like, you know, Innovision. I look at someone like Dixon, who's, you know, uh, notoriously picky about what he does, where he's, where he's like how he's presented in public, the interviews he does, where he, the, the, the mixes he puts out, uh, the edits he does. Like he's very particular. The whole label is very particular. But even him in the last couple of years, maybe since the whole GTA thing, right? You can definitely see that they've there's been there's been an understanding that although they don't want to do all the commercial things, they have to kind of somehow have a relationship with social media because that's the only way they're going to get their voice out there and be able to kind of permeate this big 
bubble of interest that exists out there for dance music. So, so they have it to kind of, you know, put up clips, uh, do, you know, that whole DJ thing behind the booth with your arms up, uh, do the whole thing of putting a, a moving image with the sound playing of your EP that's about to come out, uh, tease lineups, like all this sort of stuff on social media they probably wouldn't have done 10 years ago. They have to do it now because they know that's the best way to kind of garner interest for their brand. And in all, could, you know, in all in all, if you're in a vision, you want to keep on doing these lost in the moment parties. You want to keep on doing these really cool underground niche things. And the only way to do them is to make sure that you, all your artists, all your um, all your records are being sold. Your artists are getting booked. Your events you're playing at are selling out, so that it can kind of feed into all the underground stuff you want to you want to do. But why is it the actual DJs themselves, especially the singular ones, especially if you're not behind a label? I guess if you if you're, you know, if you're you know, signed to defect it's a bit easier because they've got a team that can kind of push it out for you. But as a solo DJ, why do we find it so naff to post on social media? Like, why do we find it so naff to be like being in a booth with our phone? Like, yeah, man, doing the thing. I can't wait, man. This is such a good, good set. I'm smashing, I'm smashing it. Why, why are we like that? Why can't we just like, in, why can't we just enjoy ourselves and kind of spread the joy? Because everyone else is video, videotaping us. Everyone else, sorry, is um, recording us on social. Everyone else is sharing it. They're all doing it. Why can't we do it ourselves? I don't know what it, what it is about us. I've, it's probably similar to the comedy scene. There's still a lot of stand-up comedians that refuse to do social media because it's looked at all, upon as that if you're funny, you you should just be funny. You shouldn't concentrate on marketing yourself, which is bizarre because how else are you going to get more gigs? How else are you going to get out there? How else are you going to get better? Right? To get better, you've got to get more gigs. Get more gigs, you've got to let people know you do the thing that you say you do. Um, I don't know. So even I, I'm struggling with it because I'm, you know, I'm, I, I would say I'm quite social media native. I've essentially tried every single social media account, every social media platform that exists out there. I've dabbled in it. I work in social media now. I'm a social media manager. Um, that's been essentially my career for the last, you know, five or six years. I've been doing all this stuff on the side, but I don't know what it, why it is, why it's so difficult to kind of pull your, like, you feel so cringe. The last thing I did when I DJed is I put my phone in a corner and sort of did an Instagram live. And then, you know, uh, after a while, Instagram shut my stream up because I was playing copyrighted music. But it, I find that so difficult to do. I don't know why. Anyway, but secondly, uh, five, produce regular content. With my show on Cashmere Radio, she says, I was able to make a short every month I had a fresh mix, whether I liked it or not, which is something I need to do more often going into the new year or going or starting this new year. I gained a lot of party bookings in the beginning through the fact that I invited people on, which is a great thing to do, which I'm not doing at the moment. Everything I'm doing is quite solo based, but again, I'm hoping through some of these videos, some of these clips, you know, something will kind of segue in there and people will be like, oh yeah, cool, this guy's, he seems to make, he, you know, he seems really enthusiastic about the scene. Maybe he DJs, oh, he does, okay, I like his mix and boom, maybe that'll happen. But again, it's just hard, isn't it? To kind of reach out. You kind of, it's such a singular process. You're just mixing at home, you're buying records, you're sending out emails to go and play places and you get there and you play, you go home. You know what I mean? But some of the best ways of getting involved or trying to get your name out there is to kind of connect and kind of, you know, but as well, I kind of like the idea of just being a part of the scene. I don't like the idea of just going out to connect to people because I want to get booked. That's not why I go out. I go out because I love music. I want to connect to people. I want to share energies and stuff. But I don't know. It's a very interesting place to be in. And again, it says here, yeah, invest in your community. I didn't have any 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 goals of climbing in some sort of social ladder, she says, or forcing integration, which is definitely what I like um, in terms of the community. I think music naturally forms community of people willing to help each other out, especially when you consider the history of dance culture, club culture, and radio culture. It's about sharing and the process, but it's also about the individual. Um, this is why I got involved in so many projects is sharing, connecting, and community. Seven, consider the metrics to assess your growth. She says, I definitely think I'm growing in terms of versatility of my sound. When I first started DJing, I was quite clear cut and, and codified in a particular sound being grind based UK club with a bit of mainstream pop and house. But looking at how i've evolved i wanted a large breadth of terms of genre and styles and mixing also i'm no means an expert at reading a crowd but i also think that this is a skill developed and i'm much more versatile and adaptable i also measure my growth by the opportunities that i've been given the ability to play around the world and my general exposure i've been able to play to such a wide variety of people in so many different situations from clubs and festivals and corporates and conferences which is amazing and eight explore all venues to stay curious avenue sorry she says, I've worked quite hard to maintain the fact that I'm a multi-genre artist. I like that. When I first started out, I had quite an energetic grime and bass sets. But then I reached out to a collective called Lekka, who does live soul and R&B shows, and asked if I could do a soul set. I love basically all forms of music, 
all genres I think I like exploring. Something I learned early on from experience with Elvis 1999, Abyss X and Nina and fellow No Shade member Aku is that going back to back is amazing. That's definitely one, one thing I definitely encourage. I'm going to do that more often now, especially with friends with the Pirate Studios, this new place that opened in London. They've got a few of them all dotted around London. They have these little DJ rooms that you can basically book for a couple of hours or maybe more. And you can, I think it's like, you know, cheap money, like maybe seven quid an hour or something, something silly like that. You can just basically play all the time, um, play, play on, you know, industry standard equipment and kind of, you know, uh, practice with your friends, play back to back and stuff and just have a good time. Um, well, another one says here, maintain a joy for your craft, uh, free financial self care. Huh. What's this about? Uh, she says, I won't lie. I've been quite overstretched and uh, that's become draining. Uh, I think making sure you are taking regular breaks and making sure you know why you're playing gigs is key. I'm lucky enough that I have a full-time job that I'm not financially dependent on my craft. That's the one. That's the one that I love to hear. Because again, this we have some, everyone's got different opinions on this, but I am a big believer that part of the reason why I love DJing so much, part of the reason why I love going out so much is that it's not my job. It's not my nine to five. If it was, I don't think I would love it as much. I think I love it so much because it allows me to escape. It allows me to kind of go out and connect to people who I probably would never meet in my day-to-day life. And it also allows me to kind of have a, a hobby, a passion that I can kind of dig into, right? Whether it's watching boiler room sets, uh, scouring through Instagram, uh, checking out forums, going on uh, Facebook pages. All this stuff is super interesting, right? It gets you involved in the community, right? Attend, going to warehouse parties, going to house parties. All this stuff is part of the scene. And it makes your love for the thing more, you appreciate it more. And I assume later in life, if I if I become a full-time, or when I become a full-time DJ, when I become a DJ that's able to kind of pay the bills with DJing, kind of kind of manifest that, it will be even more fun because I will appreciate it more because I've known, I know what it is to have a job and also kind of leave my job at six or run home, get my equipment and run out to go play until 11 o'clock, right? I know what that's like. And it's kind of made me a better DJ, a better, more appreciative person of the culture. And again, it's just made me fall in love with it all, all over again. So I think that's super important. And again, I guess for her, in her sense, this DJ here, uh, sorry, what's her name again? Kiki, Kiki Loma, Kiki Loma, I'd say. I'd say in her sense, it's probably more of a benefit because she's playing all around the world. So she comes into it fresh all the time. She's able to book holiday to go to the festival because she you knows she's got a job and she got a full time job. The jo- the DJ money is extra kind of tokens to kind of you know splash out and get do something nice for yourself, buy yourself some new equipment. It's all kind of good. It all works out really well. I'm a big fan of that kind of idea of having a full time job and then pursuing your hobby on the side. And then when your hobby on the side starts to pay all the bills, then quit your full time job. I think the idea of putting all your eggs and basket all your eggs in the basket of your hobby can be a bit problematic because it can put too much stress on it. You can be a little bit too there could be too much expectation on the thing. And I think, again, maybe it's a good thing because some comedians, I understand, I always mention stand-up comedy because I like the whole solo thing because I think it's a good place to kind of compare and contrast careers because, you know, stand-up comedy is a kind of solo endeavor. You're on the stage, you know, chatting to a microphone. Obviously obviously not for the same amount of time, but, you know, unless you're Dave Chappelle or whatever it may be. But I would say some stand-up comedians say that the only way you get successful is if you kind of cut all ties and commit everything to comedy, right? You get like a shitty part-time job you don't care about you just do set after set after set after set, right? That's how you get better. That's how you kind of progress. That's how you become an actual legit comic, which is true. But I also think there's a possibility too. You could still have a full-time job and also become a legit comic. Just work full-time. And then as soon as you end, I guess it'll be harder working full-time. That's probably why they say you should quit your job and work in a bar because I guess if you're working nine to five and then you go to a comedy club straight from five all the way into 11 every single day of the week, it will get a bit draining after a while. So maybe having the ability to kind of go to your job after you do your sets can maybe make it a bit more easier. But again, I still think the idea of having some kind of financial security, especially in this kind of flipped up economy that we're in now, can make your kind of side hustles a little bit more enjoyable. And then 10, lastly, be present with your audience. Uh, One last piece of advice. Look up the crowd when you're DJing. It seems so simple, but you can get so stuck in Mexican blending that you get so nervous and you don't want to acknowledge your audience. Again, that's something I've been doing too often now at the moment. I've definitely teed that advice. I've been definitely looking up a bit more, making contact, not doing the whole arm spreading out and kind of dancing, but that that's super naff and I think should only be reserved for people that actually like doing that kind of thing. It's not for me, again, no judgment, but I think the idea of connecting and just smiling and acknowledging, oh, sick, I'm glad you like this is awesome. Especially if the person knows the tune you're playing and they want to have a little bit of a chit chat. That's all good. So I'm a big fan of it so yeah, let's move on let's move on 
One second, quick this is text. Okay, cool. Well, let's move on. Next, next topic. 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 Rattle through them. Rattle through. Rattle through them. Rattle through. Rattle through. Rattle through. Rattle through. Oh, I want to talk about. Oh, let's talk about these actually. Um, off white Air Jordan fives. Have you guys seen these? This is awesome. These are coming out very, very soon. Um, again, Virgil has um smashed it really with when it comes to the collaboration. When it comes to trainers, right? For the most part, that's a that's probably um one of his main strengths, I would say. That and maybe the ability of making graphic t-shirts. I think he's probably one of the best graphic designers for t-shirts in the scene out there. I think his ability, because I think it's very difficult. Maybe it's not difficult. I think it's, there's a very, it's a very particular skill to make a graphic t-shirt. It's not just about, because some prints don't very, don't correlate well to being put up on a wall. I would imagine so, right? So the ability to know what works on a t-shirt is very particular. And he has a very good knack of doing it. Oddly enough, I think some of his best graphics are stuff he's done away from Off-White. I think the Off-White stuff's a bit, you know, it's not for me. I think that logo is a bit gaudy, but again, I get the appeal of it. You can spot it from a mile away. It's great branding. But I think the stuff he does for his club nights, the stuff he does for his friends or the friends and family stuff, the stuff that he did for Louis Vuitton, um, the stuff he did for Louis Vuitton when he did the little activations around the world and he had a little jewel on the map showcasing where he's at. Brilliant, genius ideas. And then secondly, the obviously the thing that really, really, really um cut up uh, really catapulted him to the stratosphere is the stuff he's done with Nike. It's been flipping out of this world, right? To design ten shoes with Nike with the ten collection he did, and for each shoe to be, you know, three times worth his value on the hype, you know, on the kind of resale market, and for the, all of them to be shoes that people actually wear day to day. Like there's not a day that goes by, especially in uh, you know, in like trendy parts of East London like Shoreditch and stuff or in Liverpool Street or wherever it may be, that I don't see somebody wearing one pair of his shoes. Like, they're so popular. It's amazing to see. That goes to show just just how talented he is and the ability to kind of design uh, shoes that are kind of timeless, that have that ability. And then also the ability to kind of design sneakers that average folk want to wear. I think that's, a very, that's, the, that's the talent, really, thinking about it that way. The idea that you can design a sneaker, not only for that, you know, the eccentric fashion, you know, fashion crew that want to get papped, you know, going to fashion shows and stuff, but just for your regular folk who just wants to kind of have something on that's a bit special, that's a little bit limited edition, that has a bit of pop to it. Um, that's really cool as well, because that was something that was kind of, I think, a slight on the back in the day collaboration where it was just colorways. A lot of those designs were only really kind of marketed towards sneakerheads, the kind of person that would have a matching t-shirt and a baseball hat. But nowadays it feels as if like the new crop of designers or the new crop of brands out there have a real knack of designing their shoes in a way that, uh, you know, the general public will want to wear them. And again, if you do that, you can kill the market with sneakerheads, fashionistas, and the general public, you know, you're onto a winner. And then here's another one. Virgil's onto a winner too, because I'm a big fan of it. And again, I'm Jordan 5s are not my favorite model. I'm a big, you know, you know my favorite model in Jordans is definitely the Jordan 4 probably even over the Jordan 1. It's my kind of staple shoe. I love it. It's the kind of shoe that I think kind of suits my style the best. But I'm not, again, and I've had Jordan 5s before. I've had Jordan 6s, 7s. I've had 8s. I've had 10s. I've even had 13s. And I've always found the 5 to be the most bulkiest, the most uncomfortable to wear, especially with jeans. This only really worked well with kind of shorts. Um, I think the only person that actually wore Jordan 5s well with jeans, especially back in the day, skinny jeans, was for, probably Fiona Fist London. He made them things look super swaggy. But again, it's the height, it's the skinniness, it's the kind of just general, you know, the way he kind of carries himself, being able to kind of rock them awesome. But apart from that, I don't see anyone wearing them really well. Or maybe kind of back in the day, Will Smith, right now, Fresh Prince, would wear them without laces. That was actually a cool way to wear them, especially with the elastic. You can kind of get away with it. But these look legitimately cool, just the way they are, like an actual shoe. I'd wear the fuck out of these. These look bloody awesome. So it's a Jordan Jordan 5 that uh, um, uh, Virgil's done for Off-White. And they're coming out, I think, for All-Star NBA Weekender. That's coming up really soon, right? NBA All-Star Weekender. Again, don't get me started on NBA. I have no idea what it's about. I know I'm black. I know I have big hands. I'm tall. But I have no idea about basketball. But as a shoe, beautiful. Um, Again, really um, interesting design overall. It looks like it's kind of inside out, outside in. Same sort of thing he's kind of done with his, most of his collaborations. you got this weird translucent fabric on the top. And then we'll obviously with the contrast stitching, you got these bright white laces, and he's just he's just essentially left the the midsole like the OG black ones that everyone kind of wears, the OG kind of uh, Jordan Five blacks, um, the ones that I think that people sometimes get the OGs that are yellowed, and they kind of do that thing where he kind of uh, clear up the the icy sole. They just, anyway, they just look flipping great, really really cool, coolly done. I'm not too sure the significance as a whole 
on both ends. But hopefully, you read the article and we'll find out. But a bit, again, visually, they look really great, man. I'd wear the F out of these. These are so, so good. And you've got shoelaces on, again on the laces, standard with the quotation marks, 23 on the side, behind this sort of like weird meshy kind of thing. I don't know where you'd get that kind of mesh where it's familiar to me somewhere. And again, on the inside, you've got the, the stamp, um, the off-white stamp that everyone knows and loves. Uh, you've got the zip tie, which I'm sure people are going to leave on their shoe. I clipped mine off on my Jordans because I've got the I've got the Chicago's and the all-whites, which I've, I've definitely clipped that tag off on mine. I don't wear them like that. But then you've got the clear eyes you saw with the jump man underneath. Again, really, really cleverly done. Um, it's really hard to go here. Uh, becoming a talk of Paris Fashion Week after being unveiled at Off-White's Fall Winter 2020 presentation, we have now have a closer look at the previously rumoured Jordan, Off-White Jordan 5. Uh, despite early conflicting rumours, the the, uh, the official, uh, officially revealed on the feet of the models and Virgil Abloh during the show, the upcoming collaboration re- reimagines the OG Black Metallic, which is what I was talking about, right? That's the, that's the one that was, you know... That was on everyone's feet, maybe, I don't know, uh, late 2000s, maybe? Was it late 2000s? I'm not sure, but late 2000s? Like, oh, what a good era for shoes, man. What a great era. And he's essentially done the same sort of things. I wonder, I wonder if that's the inside of the shoe. But yeah, so the midsole is perfectly the same, isn't it, really? It's basically the same. The same midsole, but he's basically flipped it inside out, maybe. Maybe the fabric on the in- Maybe it's, that's what it is, right? Is that how I say? Is that the fabric that's meant to be on the inside? Is on the outside? On the outside? Is it? Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that is it. Let's see the, the inside. Can we see the inside a little bit from the top? Yeah, maybe that it might be it. You know, I'm not too sure if that's actually true. But someone in the comments, let me know. I'm not sure what the significance of the holes are. But as you can see, it's sort of like a velvety suede upper. I had this colorway, but I had the later versions. I'm not. Sure. I didn't definitely didn't have these old school ones. Uh, but yeah, I always found the tongue really bulky and really hard to wear. It's really odd to lace them up all the way to the top. It looks kind of naff that way. Um, like this guy here with his feet jumping up. I hate that jumping up style on sneaker headshots. Like it's so annoying. That sort of like slow motion thing with the pin rolls. Like oh, shoot me in the face. There's, have you ever seen a sneakerhead wear a trainer good? Like ever? Never in my life have I seen a sneakerhead wear a trainer nice. It's always like regular folk or fashion people that can wear trainers, which is the most annoying because you don't want them to wear it, innit? Like, <laughs> but they're the ones that wear it well. So I guess maybe he's maybe it's the material on this little mesh bit here that he's replaced. I don't know where it comes from. And just to see what the design inspiration is behind it, where he kind of, where he decided to do that way. But it looks really cool. Is it in material on the inside? I don't know what it is, but anyway, let's carry on with the article. Uh, Colorway, silhouette with striking translucent TPE deconstructed design. Okay, that's what it is, right? TPE, right? Is that what it is? That material is TPE? What's TPE? What's TPE material? Let's see what Google says about it. TPE material. What is that? T, um, thermoplastic elastomers, uh, sometimes referred to as thermoplastic rubbers, are a class of co- copolymers or physical mix of polymers, usually a plastic and a rubber that consist of materials with both thermoplastic and elastomic properties. Okay, that's interesting. Wow. So that's what he's basically made this thing into. Okay. Let's see if we can, what's, what's a TPE sheet? Let's see what that looks like. If it's got the kind of mesh on it as well. Okay, so the same thing, just plastic essentially. But yeah, it looks really cool. I love it. Probably not going to be the most comfortable thing in the world. And it might crease really badly. That might be the only thing I'd say is probably the only bygone. But again, I wear my trainers. I don't really care about them kind of looking a bit fucked up and stuff. So if, you get, if you're more of a sneaker that doesn't like their stuff creasing and you walk like a duck, then it's going to be a problem. But if you like actually wearing your shoes, it shouldn't be an issue. The signature midfoot uh, cages on the shoe have been made, have been opened up with the circular cutouts and accented by exposed black stitching. Huh, what do they mean? So this bit here. I don't think that's the same thing though, is it? This mean that mesh bit has been kind of pulled out until the entire shoe, maybe. maybe that's what they mean. This entire thing is basically made of the entire, yeah, maybe that's the thing that he's done. Either way, it's a very clever design, I like it. Uh, it continues here. Branding comes in the form of the Jumpman, uh, marked 3M. Oh, it's 3M as well. Beautiful upside down there. Jordan patches, uh, 23 marked on the heel. Nike Air, Ma- Nike Air motifs at the rear. The other continuing elements of Virgil and Nike's ongoing collaboration partnership include the Helvetica Industrial Techs. 
Uh, the, the shoelaces emblazoned on the laces. Elevating the shoe is a black midsole with a speckled grey splashes. Although a release date has yet to surface, the Off White Jordan 5 has been rumoured to arrive in February around NBA All Star Weekend, which is definitely true because I imagine, I imagine they put out all the releases around the same sort of time uh, or sometime in April, price around 225. Actually, I think there's actually information around it, but I hope they. Hope it's not like a complex con thing where they only release it during complex con. Hope it kind of gets put out to everyone else. But let's see. I remember seeing an actual image where they had all this uh, stuff with everyone else that they're doing. Yeah, definitely here. Definitely here. I feel, I feel like I got it from Hype Beast here. Some news here actually that kind of spoke about it. So this is an article from Hype Beast. It says here, Jordan Brand taps eight Chicago creatives for an NBA All Star Weekend uh, kind of collection. So I'm assuming NBA All Star Weekend is going to be hosted in Chicago. So they tapped all Chicago natives to go and kind of put a shoe out which is great um, kind of timing because it means that they can do a shoe just after Virgil dropped the Nike 10 collaboration. So again, kudos to the universe or maybe they had planned this all in all. In all. But again, it's clear to see who's the standout shoe in this whole collection, isn't it? So what's the most... Um, we should see who's going who's to garner... We know who's going to garner the highest resale, but in terms of just the peel wearing week, day in, day out, we should just see what they're going to do. Oh, they got the guy from Lyrical Lemonade there too as well. That's awesome. So yeah, this is an article from Hype Beast. It says NBA All Star Weekend is on the horizon. Jordan Brand has gone beyond uh, the star studded game by tapping up Chicago's creative community for an eight and eight collection consisting of apparel and footwear crafted by eight creatives, eight different uh, area based creatives and their crews. The collective the collection uses City Pacific Transit lines and colors to interpret the Jordan Brand's unite ethos. Okay, leading f- things off are Virgil Abloh's found Virgil Abloh, off white founder. Apart from his highly anticipated Jordan 5, what's called a full set of black and red apparel. Da, da, da. Okay, cool. Let's go through the images quickly and see if there's anything nice that we like apart from the Virgil's Jordans. Yeah, the, the jumper's pretty cool. I'm pretty sure a lot of people are going into it, but I'm not really a fan of wearing Jordan clothing. I think if you don't play basketball, wearing basketball clothing is a bit awful. And again, a little bit of a scream, oh, what about the sneakers? Sneakers is different. People wear, tra- people wear basketball, I mean, tennis shoes, they don't play tennis, but wearing tennis clothing, like day-to-day, just around town, is really, really cringe. Same with Jordan stuff. I've never played basketball a day in my life. Like maybe I chucked the ball to an, I chucked the ball in the net once. You know what I mean? I'm saying I'm chucking as well. I'm pretty sure that's not how you used to call it. But yeah, wearing Jordan brand clothing is not on my is not on my horizon. Uh, but yeah, I like the hoodie. Hoodies are pretty cool. Again, I've no idea who these crews are. Just looking at the Jordans themselves. Yeah, some pretty decent ones in the collection so far. It looks like by the looks of it, I'm sure the Chicago will come out because I'm assuming there's quite a big creative. Uh, sort of like streetwear, you know, art, hip hop scene in Chicago, anyway. So I'm sure they'll do very well. Oh yeah, RSVP is in Chicago as well. So there's no and what's the other one? Um, is it Nomad? I forgot the other store. Is it Civil? I forgot. There's another big one too in Chicago. So I'm sure they these guys will all do very well. I'm sure their creative crews will come out and support them in their droves. But apart from the off whites, not really any more I've seen here that I actually give a toss about. But I like how they tied it all in together. But yeah, the the off whites look insanely good. I'm not gonna wear them like that with a tongue out. I think it looks a bit insane. Maybe with shorts. Um, and again, I'll be tempted to wear them with skinny jeans, but skinny jeans are not in anymore, innit? They're out. No one's wearing skinny jeans anymore. I don't want to be that guy wearing skinny jeans at the party, but yeah, definitely keep an eye out for those. When they're gonna? When's the due date for that? February fifteenth. Okay, cool. Coming up Valentine's Day weekend. So if you've got the money, you definitely save up. Make sure you get a pair for yourself. Right? Don't delay. Anyway. That's me done, man. 277, right? Another episode in the can. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. Excellent Zinger Show. Uh, if you want more information regarding myself, check out my website, excellentzinger.com. Be able to find the show notes description. If you're watching via YouTube, smash that like, click subscribe, leave me a comment. If you're listening via the podcast app, please share. Please uh, get it out there. You know, share it on your Instagram, on your Twitter, on your Facebook, wherever it may be, and leave me a five star review. And I'll see you guys again soon. Maybe tomorrow. Hopefully tomorrow. I've got some. Yeah, tomorrow's Friday. Definitely see you guys tomorrow. What episode of the show. Until then, take care. Be safe. And see you guys very soon. Bye. 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 Bye.